But first, if you live in Lancashire and you've got a blockage, fear not, for help is at hand. A lady phoned us late last night with a blockage and she's got a child's party tomorrow, so we're here to help her out, OK? Steve and Steve Hastings are a formidable filth-fighting force. These sewage supermen are a father and son team. OK, cos there's, um, there's no access point on this, um, i.e. a manhole cover, we're going to have to actually physically unscrew this, and it should. It's just going to squirt out. Watch out, lads. That soil stack looks ready to blow. Oh, there she is. It's absolutely foul, absolutely horrendous. Pipes and rags and all sorts of... Make sure you're sick. It's disgusting, isn't it? Eh? Why, why would anyone want to do this for a living? <sighs> why do I do it? Why indeed? Steve, let's go and get the jet out on. Maybe it's in the blood. He's learnt off the best, let me tell you, his dad. I'm number one for number twos. He's number two for number ones. <laughs> <laughs> Twycross Sioux in the East Midlands is home to some rather large waste makers. We've got five elephants on the section, four females and then one little calf who's a male. On average, these Asian elephants will eat over 250 kilograms of food per day. Over 50% of what they eat comes straight out the other end. It's zookeeper Matt O'Leary's job to keep on top of a daily mountain of dung. First of all, we have to clean up their, uh, their mess they've made throughout the night. We brush all the uh, poo into the middle, not into one nice pile, and then we can just come in with the wheelbarrows, long-handled shovels and, uh, and just get it all in the barrows, um, up the ramp and into the trailer. Uh, that gets pretty much full every day. We take about 12, 12 wheelbarrows, maybe more of poo a day. Um, sometimes it's close to a tonne of poo. So why is it so important to clear this stuff up so often? In the wild, they go off the move from place to place to place. Obviously, there's no one there picking up poo behind them. That's, it's not necessary. But obviously here, if we just left the poo in there, obviously they'd be sleeping in their own faeces and in their own urine. So it's very important that we clean them up. That sounds like a very smelly task. Being in with them every day, you kind of get used to it, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's worse than others, but we kind of don't really notice it anymore. If you ever go into the shops after work, you forget how bad you smell. So. It's the same for senior keeper Luke Harvey. I don't notice it at all, but you go home and you get told you stink, but um, I don't think it smells. Elephant's dung is just fibre, and none of this waste will go to waste. So this is all ready to go down to the composter. But the dung also provides important information about its creator. How we tell really if an elephant is well is pretty much by their faeces. Um, you can tell by looking at this, it's all nice. If you look at this closely, it's all got hay and straw in there, which is pretty much all they eat, so there's nothing wrong with that at all. See, it's nice and round, it's firm. Um, if an elephant was unwell, it'd be sloppy. I wouldn't be able to pick that up. I wouldn't want to pick it up. It would stink. Um, so that's fine like that. That's a real nice round poo. We're pleased with that. There are several uses for elephant dung. Some people even make paper from it. But here at the zoo, there's a more pressing need. So I've picked up the, uh, the elephant dung um, and I brought it down here to our compound um, where I will unload it into this, into this pen here um, and then it will be uh, pushed through this machine here and eventually come out here, all nice and uh, fermented. The composting process is a steamy affair. The elephant dung is added to other recyclable products. It's a mixture of everything we've got on the zoo, Bratley. It's straw, hay, bits of paper, twigs, cardboard, elephant, milk, giraffe milk, the lot. It's all very environmentally friendly. Using this compost is a totally new way of going on. Normally, it's thrown away into the quarries or the landfill, but not now. It's a never-ending story of filth fighting. We do this every day, every day without fail, because um, if we left that for a day, then it would just mount up, probably wouldn't even fit in a trailer. Not that Luke objects to dung shoveling. I don't mind doing it at all. It's good exercise, really. Um, and there's nothing wrong with this. It's all, it's all fruit and veg, so it doesn't smell. Well, it doesn't smell to me anyway, so uh, 
I'll do this all day if I had to. <laughs> if you're going to work with animals, it's, it's made very uh, clear very quickly that a lot of it is cleaning. So it's uh, something that obviously we don't mind doing. It's, um, it's a privilege to work with the animals, so we don't mind picking up the poo every now and again. It's not bad at all. Back in Preston, father and son team Steve and Steve have a drain to unblock. Dad has brought another member of the family along to help out. This, this is my baby, this. Not, not Steve's baby. Big Steve's baby. <laughs> That's only because I didn't like the chalk out. Come on, Dad. There we go. Time for some invasive surgery. We put that in to the bottom. And Steve, Steve will switch it on, and the pressure will take the hose through the bends and clear the blockage. Just as well this isn't filmed in smell vision Oh, lovely. Looks like we've got it. <laughs> Pressure's taking it through. Well, for me to put, maybe put a little bit of a twist in it like that is going to help it, as you can see, going down. Right, Steve, turn it off. I think we've got it. That's the blockage done. All we've got to do now is uh, clean down. The old master hands over to the pupil. In this job, you've got to start at the bottom. As you can see, covered in, covered in sewage. Sewage there, pretty, pretty standard, yeah. Just add a bit more to me uh, after shave collection. <laughs> Just clean that bit down there, son. Not down here. In time-honoured tradition, the pupil works at the foot of the master. What I have to put up with every day. Every... The student makes a clean sweep and the teacher calls time. Right, that's done. Um, on to the next one. Woo! It's a sad fact of life that when we die, our bodies become waste matter that must be safely disposed of. Meet John Trott, crematorium technician. Here at Hither Green Crematorium in South East London, John dispatches around 45 bodies every week. This is the chapel. Uh, this is where the, the minister does his service. And uh, at the end of the service, this is where the, the coffin is placed and lowered down into the crem cremator. The cremator is a specialised oven that will be heated to around 1,000 degrees Celsius, and it's usually on all day long. And we normally have between, it can be anything, between up to about 12, 13 services a day. John doesn't have to wait long for his first job of the day. Just waiting for the coffin to come down ready for the next cremation. So hopefully, the vicar uh, pulls his finger out, I should make a bit of progress. We've got three cremators here. One is the large one for the, for the larger people. We live in a society now where people are getting larger, so uh, it's getting used more often now. So... But it's not being used today. Once it's charged, Dean, I shall go round to the computer, punch in all the details of the person and monitor the same machines from there onwards. It takes about two and a half hours for each cremation and John keeps a careful eye on progress. Every time we do, we always check for smoke on the chimney. 
but everything's okay. Everything's running perfect. Um, there's all filters. There's all filters up in up in the chimney stack anyway, so it, 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 uh, it relates all the smoke coming out. So how do you become a crematorium technician? Well, I've always worked for the uh, the cemeteries for about 30 years, like working in the grounds of ground maintenance. And a vacancy arose, and I applied for it and successfully got the job. Well, I was working outside, you know, in all weathers. At least, you know, you're in the nice and dry. Quite enjoy it. It's quite a good, nice little job. But cremation isn't the only way that our loved ones are laid to rest. Coming up, what John does in minutes takes four grave diggers several treacherous hours. There's a number of stories, no injuries, even fatalities. Oh, there she is. Where there's muck, there's brass. Hey there, Stevie. Well, what our job? And it's bath time for a filthy family. That's what you have to do, just uh, constantly clean up after them. In the green crematorium in south-east London, John is consigning another coffin to the flames. It's a very efficient process, and John means to keep it that way. Today's been uh, running quite smoothly, everything's up to date. There's no, uh, no one waiting round the back to go in, so uh, just waiting for the next service to come down, and that's it. I'm up to scratch, I should say. I'm on target, they're all in. Body and coffin renders a few pounds of leftover material. John rakes out the remains for cooling. That is the perfect cremation. Mainly bone and bits of the box is left. Everything is uh, all gone. Each box of cremains is carefully identified before John takes it to the cremulator. This is a cremulator or a, a ball mill, and uh, inside there are granite balls which pulverise the bones into uh, what we see now is cremated remains. As you can see, all the bones have been all crushed up now. All that's left is either the, the panel pins or pins, etc., nails. What's left in the, in the coffin and uh, the hip joints, which may have been in the body, they've all crushed up now nicely, and now they've all dropped into the hopper below. The average human will produce around 200 cubic inches of cremains, or approximately one cubic inch of ash for every pound of flesh and bone. The cremains are decanted into temporary containers. Now John's job is done, and the family can collect their loved one's remains. Well, these, these pots, yeah, they're uh, on hold. Once the family decide what to do with them, either that or sometimes the family forgot. So they need reminding, and uh, then they make a decision up in the, you know, the near future, hopefully. It's a job that might be too much for some, but John adopts a philosophical attitude. You're born, you live. And you die, it's simple as that. It's what you do in between. Not that I've done much, but there you go. <laughs> but it's us, I look at it, really. You, you're born and you die, as simple as that. Nearby, there are four men who would probably love to have John's job. Meet the grave diggers of Lewisham Cemetery. Uh, we're going to start excavating the grave uh, shortly. Uh, we'd like to, like to make sure there's enough time between now and the funeral uh, burial time, just in case there's any deterioration for the grave as we're digging. Just about to mark out the grave now. Using a standard human sized template, W marks the spot. We are loading the boards to put the soil on that we're going to excavate, so it's easier to fill in when we backfill the grave. And pretty soon, the going gets dirty. 
Jerry driving the digger. We keep him in there, he scares the public a little bit. Sometimes he gets blackened out a little bit so no one can see him. But digging holes in a damp cemetery can be a grave business. It might sound slightly callous, but uh, the, way, the way we view it is we dig a hole and you know, we make sure it's safe. But things can often go horribly wrong. But sometimes uh, it can collapse in such a way that the, the coffins adjacent can be exposed. We've reached the required five foot now. We're just getting the shoring in there as quick as possible now. OK, we're starting to get a little bit of water, so we need to act quick on this. This is where we send young Robert down to okay. insert the lower shoring. <laughs> if Robert fails to shore up the sides correctly, it could be curtains. Yeah, what I'm doing here, I'm just putting in one of these rams, which holds the walls so there's no risk of uh, any collapse down the bottom of the grave. Mission accomplished. It looks like Robert will live to dig another day. There's a number of stories, you know, injuries, even fatalities, uh, in terms of uh, being crushed by the clay, because once you get a little bit of clay break away, a lot does follow. You got to do some gymnastics. Yeah, no, it's, gone, it's gone well, it's gone well. A little bit of water down there. Um, it, it will get worse as the day's gone on, but that can be uh, managed and that can be taken out. The lads cover up the topsoil in time for the funeral service. Kerry's really good at making the bed at home. <laughs> Years of training. Years of practice. After making good the final resting place, it's time for a well-earned rest of their own. Now I've got an opportunity to go back, have a cup of tea, warm myself up, get a little bit dry. They call this the mess room, and it's easy to see why. <laughs> uh, the clay just sticks to absolutely everything. And before you know, at the end of the day, you just weigh down all these heavy clay. And so that's probably the worst part of probably about the job, isn't it? I say out of every four blokes, you probably get one that stays, don't you? Like one of those new members starting. Yeah. It may be wet, cold, and muddy, but for these lads, grave digging just might be a job for life. <laughs> Back at Twycross Zoo, the day's dung has been collected and taken to the composter for recycling. With the elephants outside, it's a chance for keeper Hayley New to carry out the daily deep clean. We wash the house at about 100 degrees, so obviously to kill any bacteria or anything. It's very important just to make sure all the faeces and urine is completely washed off the floor for the elephants' hygiene, especially for their feet. Things like little stones that get in their feet can then become infected if you leave the faeces and the urine on the floor. Now the house is all ready, so if we need to put any food down for the elephants, uh, which we probably will do today because it's quite cold outside, so they'll need to come back in, which means that the house will get dirty straight away again. Um, but that's what you have to do, just uh, constantly clean up after them. With a clean elephant house, it's a good time to check on the elephants themselves. So we check the elephant's health, um, we, give them, we give them a quick scrub and then we're going to hose, hose each elephant down and possibly give one of them a, a big uh, tea tree oil scrub so their skin's nice and fresh. Also, if we need to do any foot care, um, this is when we do it. A healthy elephant is a clean elephant. Being able to scrub them, we can like, get rid of any dead skin that's forming and obviously get rid of any bacteria that might be forming in the dead skin. It is better for the elephant's health for us to be able to go in and do this and see any defects that we could also then go back to and, and treat if necessary. Um, it's a great bonding process as well for the people and the elephants, so it's important for us to do it on a daily basis so we can keep up the trust and the, and the, you know, the, fr the friendship, if you like, between keeper and elephant. Man and beast, it seems, can live in filth-free harmony. In Blackpool, a block sewer means big business for father and son teams, Steve and Steve. So what's the nature of this big job? Oh, there she is. Hey there, Stevie. Hey there. Just noticed another manhole further down. If this isn't empty, this, is, this has got a crust on it as well. It's just a nightmare, but we don't complain. What we're going to have to do is dilute this Get this, that should release the other manhole. Job done, hopefully. 
It can be handy when your dad is the boss and it comes to holidays. Are you off skiing then? Skiing. Um, I'm going on the Sunday. I need to take you as well. Yeah, well, you'd love it. Absolutely love it. It's, it's just fantastic. It's awesome. Would it yeah. be a paid holiday? Nice little bonus. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say a bonus, but it might it might be a paid holiday. Carving <laughs> some, like that. No French frying. But first, there's some serious filth to be fought. A quick blast of water, and the blockage is cleared. Oh, there she goes. Well done, lads. Number one for number two, son. Another job done, eh? One of the easiest ones. I love them on a Friday as well. Bit of dilution, bit of rods, it's gone. <laughs> we love it, we love our job. Looks like Steve and Steve have cracked the problem just in time. Is that newborn? Newborn, yeah. Wow, newborn. when? When did you have that? Yeah. Just finished off now, cleaned it all down, yeah, everything's fine for you now. Use yeah. your toilet. Oh, man. Fine. Okay. Oh, thanks Ed, so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Beautiful. All right, hey so kids, you alright? Nice. Man, you don't fall down there, kids. Nice to see the smiley. New baby there, fantastic, we've done our job. Number one for number twos. <laughs> Come on. Let's go. Let's get out of here. So the moral is, you're born and then you die. And in between, there's the messy business of life.